Right. So yeah, this is just my experience of working on getting traffic to Bro through, uh, and we actually have external um, boxes to, to load balancer traffic. And these are some of the considerations that, there we go, that I've had to, to think about while we were tapping things. Some of these I actually inherited, so it's not that I made the decision, but I've thought back about why um, or if it was best and things like that. Um, you know, WAN, whether you're going to tap internal or external. Uh, and we'll get to uh, another slide to talk about more about why you'd pick that. But some of the stuff, um, I talked to Seth about this, is that if you're doing internal tapping, uh, if you tap across the multiple routers internally or between switches and routers, you have the chance of sending your cluster that flow twice from two different taps. And currently, Seth tells me that Bro doesn't like that at all. So um, that's a cons not that it's impossible to do these things, but it's certainly a consideration that you'll have to think about. Um, so on this diagram, just a generic network layout, it's easy. And this is what we have right now is we just have the WAN links tapped. Um, there's more than a couple of them, but you just each one of them you just get, and you're not going to see flows going through, complete flows, traversing multiple WAN links. So you're not going to have a problem with duplication of packets. And then if you do choose to do internal stuff, and you might, like I said, Bro doesn't like duplicates, there are ways to get around that. Either you can use separate clusters for each flow, or you could use an external device, which I'll get to in some further slides. This is just about getting the data to your, uh, to your Bro cluster. There's taps and mirror or span ports. Um, there's a money concern whenever you talk about taps. Uh, optical things are just not cheap. Uh, in order to put them in place, you're going to have to down the connection, whether it's short period or long period. You know, uh, you're going to have to down that WAN link and put it back in. You also have issues with light levels. So um, that's actually something uh, I've ran into recently is that some of the light levels we're receiving on our splitters are uh, less than the sensitivity level of our taps. And so we're having to look into, OK, how can we clean up the light path? Is there actually dirty connectors? Or is there just not enough light coming in off the, uh, the WAN link coming into the building that using a splitter, we're just not going to end up with enough light, and we have to think about something else? Um, recently, I was working with on Gigamon and stuff. And they're like, well, you should use 50-50 taps. Um, right, currently, we're not. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily something that you should just say, OK, we're going to use 50-50 taps on 10 gigabit connections. It's more of you should actually do the math um, and figure out the light levels that are going to end up going to your router, the light levels that are going to end up going to your, uh, whether it's straight into a bro uh, transceiver or into a box transceiver. The other thing, I, I was recently talked to an optical person, and they said, when you get a tap, actually put light into it of a known value, and then record the output. because He's run into issues where taps are like, hey, it's 70-30. No, really, it's about 60-20. You know, there's just 20% that disappeared. Um, and so you should do some quality checking of your own when you, get a, when you receive a tap to make sure that it's the advertised ratings and there's not an issue with it. Uh, another issue, another, we have standalone taps. And then, but you can buy built-in taps that are actually part of an external device, like the Gigamons. Uh, my thought on that is that. I think it's too restrictive. They may be less expensive, but you're tied into a particular vendor. And if you decide, well, we don't really want that external device anymore, well, there went the money you paid for the taps also. And also, if you're doing some testing recently, I wanted to eliminate uh, the external device from our testing. We were having packet loss. And we're like, OK, where is it coming from? So I was able to just take the tap output uh, pull it out of the external device, which is a GigaView, and plug it straight into a transceiver plugged into the interface on a Bro cluster member. And then we could look at it that way. Whereas if the tap was built in on a card on the GigaView box, that would really wouldn't have been possible. Are there any questions about our experience? That's well, so you're losing 20, is what I'm saying, is that there was just something defective with that. Um, I haven't actually installed any of those. Those are done by the net engineering group. Okay. So, um, so 
And a good, another good reason to put a known light source on what you suspect is the end, and then do measurement readings on what you know to the tool and to the router uh, device to test those levels. And then on to um, using span ports instead of taps. Some concerns that I have about span ports, and we don't use these in general, we're all taps, is that you're now trusting another device to get you the traffic correctly, that either it's, it's doing it right, it's not a hardware defect, and it's not misconfigured improperly. And then the other issue that I've heard people talk about uh, running into when you're doing span ports is two things, is uh, you're, you want to get these span ports off of your router so you have multiple WAN links and you're using up one span port for every WAN link you have that adds up to a lot of cards a lot of ports on cards and management says no you know we're bringing up another WAN link and we don't want to buy a whole nother card for one port we're just going to take one of your span ports you don't need that for a little while and the other issue is when networking discovers that perhaps they have an error or that they have a defective card or transceiver and they just go well that's just security's thing it's not operational and they just swap it around and take your stuff for a little while. So again, with span ports um, or with, uh, with taps, you're not going to run into that issue. The tap's there. It's kind of permanent. The only time that I would suspect that uh, somebody else would get into stuff is if the light level started dropping and they're like, we want all the light right now. Um, the good thing about using span ports, and I've thought about this, uh, is that you can just immediately start, if you're not normally, so if you've chosen to do all WAN links and none of your internal stuff, you could use an in, a span port off an internal router. If you want to all of a sudden go, I really need to see what's going on off of a host that's on this, uh, this router. You can do it on the fly without interruption to the network. You don't have to go pull any links, anything. Um, so that's, and you know, I don't know if you just have a spare standalone uh, broke uh, box, not even part of a cluster just sitting there waiting for when you do the things like that. Uh, but it's thought that you might want to do that. Uh, asymmetric routing, or excuse me, asymmetric uh, traffic routing is an issue that you can uh, run into. That's one that we actually have here. We have a lot of uh, WAN links, and traffic will come in on one and leave on another. So we we have to aggregate those flows because Bro doesn't like it if it doesn't see both directions of uh, or both sides of the flow at one cluster member. And there's a couple of ways to do that. Again, we'll go into some hardware. And I think you could do that with some external boxes would do that for you also. We haven't run into that. I have not run into that here. So, um, And then load balancing is another reason that you're going to, so you aggregate, so we need to aggregate all the flows from all of our taps, and then we load balance from there across our cluster members. Uh, one of the concerns Seth brought up was tuples, um, is how many tuples your devices are doing. Um, the ones that we're using, the GigaViews can actually recently, they added code that you can specify two tuple load balancing um, inside the box so that we can keep all the IP source destination or IP source mappings, uh, destination mappings going to one host. Nice picture to get away from the text. Um, just an idea of thoughts that you might want have you have multiple LAN links that you have multiple WAN links that are possibly doing asymmetric traffic routing but you don't have enough traffic to need a cluster have a box bring all those WAN links together and send them into a single box you might have one WAN link that uh, can completely overload a single bro member so you want to expand that out across a cluster or in the case of what we have here which is we have multiple WAN links and they can easily overload a single cluster, so then we have those being load balanced, aggregated, first aggregated, and then load balanced across uh, the cluster members. Hardware boxes, uh, we have the Gigamon GigaViews here. And some of the issues we run into when working with Gigamon, um, they really want you to buy transceivers from them. In fact, uh, I had a support call with them and we were having an issue 
it turned about to be unrelated to the transceiver, but we had an issue. He ran uh, you know, a, a show tech, basically, on the interface, and it said, oh, you didn't buy that from us. Um, I'll, get you in, I'll get you in contact with the salesman. Was, that was basically the end of the support conversation. Uh, so, uh, and that was for uh, direct connect cables, not even optical. Um, so there's some issues with that. Some of the things we were talking about with, uh, if you're doing internal taps, where you can get, uh, you could tap, end up seeing a flow from two different taps, is you get duplication. Uh, there's a Giga Smart Board that they've added to the lineup that can actually, with some tweaking, do deduplication. It can say, oh, I just saw this less than 10 milliseconds ago. I'm, this is a duplicate, I'm gonna throw it away, kind of stuff. Uh, it does some load balancing. Right now, the Gigamons are limited to eight members. So if you aggregate all of your traffic into a single aggregation, you can then only load balance it across eight outputs. Um, that's not enough for us because we can overwhelm, well, currently it is enough for us. But eventually we expect that it won't be and we'll want to aggregate across more than eight physical uh, NICs. Yes? Uh, they're 10. Their 10 gig are the ones. Um, I think they have, our gig of views only, I'm only working with the 10 gig interfaces on our gig of views, so I'm not sure. There are some rules, I think they have to be the same speed, yes. but I think you can have gig or 10 gig as, be, as members. So, okay. yeah. um, now I've recently talked with Gigamon and their new H series devices. Uh, they have a feature request in to increase the load balancing to poss they're looking at uh, 256 member load balancing. So that'll be really nice. Currently, our solution is to, we have Gigamons feeding Gigamons. So uh, a, a, this, the top tier box is streaming four streams into other boxes, and then those other boxes are taking each stream and splitting it up across eight more streams. So uh, we have the capability of moving into more than eight uh, cluster members that way. Uh, there's an issue that you run into that, that I like, recently, just last week, we, we figured out what was going on, is that the GigaViews are using the same hash uh, algorithm with the same hash seed at the first level and the second level, which doesn't work then when you're sorting on that. They have also put in a feature, re uh, uh, feature request for me that lets you set the seed value of the hash per box. Um, that has not Im been implemented yet, but that does let you uh, tier their boxes and use two tuple aggregation at multiple levels without it saying, oh, you already sorted the evens out. Um, right now, what we do is we're actually changing. One level is doing two tuple hash uh, sorting, and the next level is doing four tuple, is the way we got around it for now. Yes. So taps. So the, the, the GigaViews are completely separate and away from the network. Uh, the, 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 the WAN links come in, they go into the taps, 70% of the light goes over to the routers, 30% goes under the floor, comes up on another row in the data center, comes up into um, two collection, GigaView collection devices, and then... Well, what are those taps? You have separate taps. Separate standalone taps and a little rack next to the, the routing gear. They're um, net optics, is that? I, I'm not. Oh, Gigamon. Okay, so they're Gigamon branded external, but there's several tapping companies, and in general, that's not something I ever expect. You know, as far as branded things, Gigamon, I don't expect them to say, "Oh, you're not using our taps." Yeah, okay. that, that no. So yeah, they're just external taps, and that way, you know, I've moved the equipment around, um, but I'm just not near the networking equipment, the production networking equipment. I'm in the security racks, and networking in general just doesn't care what I do over there, so. Another company that uh, I haven't worked with personally, I've been on a couple of calls, I know Seth has worked with them on some stuff, is CPacket. One of the things I liked about CPacket when I talked to them is that they have certified major uh, non-branded you know, transceivers that aren't their own brand. And they said, if you really like some transceiver brand that we haven't done, we will do that for you. Which, you know, I know when it, some of the cost of this equipment, but when you're punking down pretty big bucks for transceivers, you need 30 or 60 of them. It adds up, and it's nice if you don't have to buy 
somebody that's it's paying for a salesman's vacation as opposed to getting you know commodity transceivers from somewhere. Uh, Seth talked about this. So CPacket does port and MAC address load balancing. So they can actually rewrite the destination MAC address up to I believe 48 MAC addresses. What this allows you to do is that you then feed from the CPacket. You can feed into a commodity uh, Ethernet switch and then use the Ethernet switch to further that'll distribute it across your uh, to your cluster members. And then they also have, I talked to, I got CPacket to answer me on some stuff about deduplication. They prefer that you actually do filters. Um, I didn't get into the details with them, but they have some deduplication uh, methods, but they prefer that you filter things away so they don't, uh, that doesn't become a problem for you. I'm, you'd have to discuss that with them exactly what they uh, what they were meaning on that one. And then Seth went into this earlier. So get into cluster load balancing actually on the member. So get a big chunk and then you have a, you have a server that has 12 processors in it. Let's assign 10 of them to 10 separate bro instances and let's have that traffic load balanced at the, the, uh, at the NIC level. We use Miracoms um, and they have a pay for sniffer driver that does this very well. And then there are some also some options with Intel uh, cards, PF ring. Uh, there's the flow director that's actually built into the hardware and then there's also some uh, pay for drivers that are from NTOP. So one, one nice thing about the uh, doing it in the Miracom is it offloads a lot of stuff from the CPU, right? So PFRAME was, when we had, we're using PFRAME, we had fewer um, cores available, I think. Isn't that correct? Uh, we were dropping packets at the kernel level. Uh -huh. um, Seth or Sam could. Okay. And if, duplication is another nice thing that you can get with that. Right, so I, we just learned that the, the sniffer has, uh, Miracom offers a couple of different sniffer drivers versions, and their most advanced one, which I think is just to, called 2.0, can actually uh, duplicate traffic to multiple instances. It can copy p traffic to multiple cores, and so you could actually have something not bro running on that server and send uh, a flow to that also, so you could have some other analyzer running. Um, that's something that the so that's a restriction on the Gigamons when you're using what's called the Gigastream, is that those are called, uh, you can only send that traffic to a single port, so you cannot actually duplicate uh, and create separate streams to separate tools when you're using their load balancing. If you're sending all the traffic to single ports, you can actually send traffic to, se to one stream of traffic to two separate uh, tools, but not when you're using their load balancing streams. And then just some extra thoughts. Um, if you're looking for external aggregation and load balancing boxes is, can the box help you with large data streams that are gonna overload uh, or have the possibility to overload a bro cluster member, uh, such as uh, Grid FTP? Um, they offer, Gigamon has a thing called slicing. So you can actually tell it, okay, I am, if, it, if the packet or the, somehow the, the, the data matches this filter, just after this byte boundary, just throw it away. Don't send any more of it. Don't send it along to the tool. Um, and CPacket also has smart ports that can do that. On the Gigamons, it's a board you have to have that enables that feature for the box. It's called a Gigasmart board. Um, I'm not, I believe CPacket's just come with these, um, and there's a certain limited number of them per CPacket device. And then, like I brought up earlier, if your load, bal if your load balancing occurs, uh, at multiple places, make sure that your tuple hash sorting things aren't messing with, it, with each other. You'll end up with strain results when all of a sudden, uh, or when you enable it and cluster members just start getting zero traffic. <laughs> Which, that's when I originally called Gigamon and they said, oh, you don't have our transceivers. Well, it was actually, this was the problem. So, but we got there eventually. <coughs> and that's all I have. Um, are there any questions? about how we're doing it or thoughts. There was, um, so I had it earlier on doing internal things and multipathing. So one multipathing that we are dealing with is multipath, just multipathing on the, on the WAN links. So a path out to the internet is taking a different path in. One that just occurred to me this morning that I have not even thought about it enough or talked with network engineering to, to know 
what problems it could cause is uh, equal cost multi-pathing. Um, so for internal connections, if you're doing tapping internal things, I haven't even thought of all the considerations for that, but I'm sure that it can cause problems and you should think about it um, if you're using that on your internal network. <coughs> 